All right, thank you so much. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, Executive Presence. My name is Ebony Jones. I am the Learning Services Intern at the Council of Michigan Foundation. Um, it has been a pleasure meeting all of you in person at the kickoff, and if you weren't there, communicating, communicating with you through phone and email. Um, just to kind of touch base with some of the things that Shannon announced regarding putting your phone on mute, um, being conscious of if there's any music playing in the background of your phone line, if you were to put us on hold, we do encourage you to put us on mute instead. And if you have any technical trouble, you can view the slide that I have up right now, and please use that number to contact them regarding any issues. Um, I would like to introduce you to our speakers today, Lynn Wooten, who is Associate Dean of Undergraduate Programs and Clinical Professor of Strategy, Management, and Organizations at the University of Michigan, Law School of Business, and she is um, a CMS scholar in residence. She provided us with that wonderful video for our kickoff presentation if you attended. And Shannon Polk, um, who helped facilitate our earlier discussion on Thanksgiving food <laughs> that we're having <laughs> next week, um, who's an awesome facilitator as well, consultant and attorney specializing in the nonprofit and philanthropic sectors. Um, she has worked to promote social and economic justice for disadvantaged communities and populations and development leadership training programs for women and people of color. So it is my pleasure at this time to turn it over to Shannon. Thank you so much, Ebony, for that fabulous um, introduction. Um, so today's webinar is Executive Presence, Connecting the Dots Between Merit and Success. Lynn will be um, leading you through uh, the curriculum around Executive Presence. Let me just walk you through our agenda for today. So we're going to start off with a roll call, and then we'll discuss the video. Everyone was sent a link uh, earlier. Uh, to a three-minute video we'll be on executive presence. We'll be discussing that. After we discuss the video, uh, we'll be t talking about how you conceptualize executive presence, how do you enact it in your role, and then we'll also be talking about the connection between executive presence, the principles that we'll discuss today, and your 360 leadership assessment. Uh, when we finish that part of our conversation, we'll move into the next steps and then talk about our future events. So let's start with a roll call. I'm going to ask everyone if you could uh, take yourself off mute, uh, give everyone your name, and then if we could begin by you telling us one of the takeaways that you had from the video. So uh, I'm going to go over here to the participant list, and I'm going to start with Avery. Uh, I believe was the first person that joined us. So Avery, if you could begin. Um, once again, clarifying your name, where you work at, and then what was one? What was your one major takeaway uh, from the video? Hi, Shannon and uh, Lynn and everyone else. It's nice to, to be talking to you today. Um, now I'm hungry, thanks to the Thanksgiving meal <laughs> discussion. Um, so the one thing that I um, kind of, as I was taking notes on the video, highlighted was that um, the piece about be honest about your assumptions, so you're not ambushed by them. I think that's a really good point that it's okay to have some assumptions, but just be aware of them. Okay, great. Thank you, Avery. Uh, next, Caitlin. Hi. Oh, your class. Uh, she said she still had a class, but she encouraged whatever it said. Hello, Caitlin. <laughs> we can't hear you. If you could speak up a little bit. Okay. For some reason, we're having a little difficulty hearing Caitlin. So let's move. Let's come back to Caitlin and move on to Kayla. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. I just got connected into the audio, so I apologize if I missed the first part. No problem. Um, so right now we're just doing roll call and asking everyone to give their uh, one takeaway from the video that you were asked to watch prior to okay. the webinar today on executive presence. So I really liked the um, when the presenter asked us to think about experiences where we 
either gave a really strong presentation or a really not so strong presentation, or um, sometimes we felt that we communicated very well versus we communicated not well at all. And then to think about the circumstances around that and the strategies that were used, um, because it immediately uh, caused me to do that. So I did think about certain situations, and it was helpful in framing the strategies to me. All right, thank you. Kaylee. Um, I believe we have someone, if everyone can mute their phone except for the person that's speaking. Uh, Kaylee? Oh, Kaylee said she's not able to connect to the audio. Okay, no problem. Moving right along to Laura. Laura Ott. Oh, okay. Good Good afternoon. I had heard another Laura, and I wanted to make sure it was the right one. So I am Laura Adi. <laughs> um, uh, I greatly appreciated from the um, video the reminder to check assumptions as well. Um, going into some tough meetings recently, and um, it was a good reminder as there's another one tomorrow morning to really um, – in essence, put myself in the other party's shoes to understand they're um, really dealing with some significant pressures on some deadlines, and we are delivering them, but maybe not sending the message in a way that really speaks to the urgency. So that could also maybe tie into some of the communications as well. But I thought it was, uh, especially for a three-minute video, very well done. Appreciated it. Thank you. No problem. Laura Sharphorn. Hello, Laura. Okay. Uh, no, Laura, we cannot hear you. She just sent a, sent something via chat. We can't hear you. So there are some people. Um, we'll we'll come back to Laura Sharpon. Lauren, yep, do you want to give your takeaway? Sure, Lauren Grebel. Yeah. Um, it's uh, the same with the assumptions. Um, that were also mentioned, just making sure that, you know, to check those at the door and um, just that's basically what I took away, especially going into a big meeting um, tomorrow and making sure that I'm doing that um, and being aware of that. Excellent. Thanks. Maurice. Good afternoon. Um, so echoing everyone else, I, I obviously um, thought the assumption piece was kind of the eye-opener for me, but I think that it really connected to um, the third part, which was um, energy. Uh, you know, the assumptions can really drive sometimes how you engage with uh, the parties and the audiences that you have in those meetings, um, particularly if they're external or internal. And I think just remembering those assumptions and how they impact your energy and your, your nonverbal cues is important. Thank you, Maurice. Yeah. Nicole. Hello. I am also going to echo everybody um, about, the, about reviewing the communication strategies. Um, I found that really helpful, especially I am a terrified public speaker. So basically the information that I gave about um, being prepared and reviewing all your strategies before your meeting was very helpful. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank Do you. we have anyone else who has joined us that would uh, like to share their takeaway? If you could just state your name and then give your takeaway. Hi. Yes, this is Ben Oliver at the Grand Rapids Community Foundation. Um, you know, I think uh, there's a common thread amongst the other um, uh, people on this call. Um, for me, it was, you know, it's oftentimes when before you go to a meeting, you're obsessing about your plan and how, you know, all the things you're going to say, and sometimes just the idea of um, really putting yourself in the shoes of the audience and, and you know, what, what messages will, will resonate, um, I think can even take a little bit of pressure off of that notion of presence in a meeting um, as well because you are starting with that empathy and you're thinking less about yourself and you're thinking about the others. So that was the, some things that recalled when I saw the video as well. Thank you, Ben. Appreciate that input. Any Anyone else? This is Lucille, and I'll piggyback off what Ben just said, and it would be energy for me. 
that stood out. And um, when I think of myself um, or client to client, how I have to sometimes give myself a break in between to get myself present in order to walk in and be totally um, mindful and present in the next meeting or with the next client that I'm going to be at or be with. Certainly. Hi, this Anyone is Laura Sharporn from High Scope. Thanks, Laura. Hi, sorry, I had I was in on my computer, but I didn't realize you couldn't hear me, so I'm calling in now. Um, so I really like the suggestion, as um, a couple other people mentioned, of to reflect on examples of when I've been on my A game and when I haven't been, um, because that did bring up some themes for me. Um, so that was really helpful to reflect on. Um, and then another item that she said that you should videotape yourself um, to observe the nonverbal communication that you're giving off. Um, and I have never done that, and I've, I've heard it a couple times to do that. Um, and so I think this, just hearing it one more time, was kind of the kicker for me. So I'm definitely going to do that sometime soon. Excellent. Anyone else want to weigh in on the video discussion? Yes, this is Takia Nelson from the Kellogg Foundation. I'm on the. Um, so I think that for me, the whole the whole concept was a high opener for me, um, because as much as I I want to be authentic in in various interactions, sometimes I don't see um, that being intentional and like um, really thinking about my presence, how do I interact and. Um, and, and just really just taking the time to think beyond my presentation and the information that I want to convey to how do I want to be received and um, how am I going to best show up um, beyond, you know, just looking professional. So I think that the, the, the whole concept was um, an eye-opener for me and, and definitely the tips on videotaping yourself and, um, and your energy were um, really things that I'm going to try, even though I'm terrified of seeing myself on videotape. <laughs> well, I will. I want to encourage everyone, if you have not uh, videotaped yourself doing a three- to five-minute presentation, it is probably one of the most helpful things you'll do to understand uh, how you're presenting yourself, verbals and nonverbals, as well as the energy level that you bring uh, into meetings and into conversations. It's uh, a great way to uh, get feedback uh, that is unfiltered and extremely accurate. Uh, is there any, any other participants on the call that uh, have not spoken up? We just want to acknowledge that you're here. Um, so we just want to make sure we've got that we're accurate with our roll call. Anyone else present? Hi, this is Suzanne Moran with the William Davidson Foundation. Hi, Suzanne. Thank you for joining us. Oh, you're welcome. Anyone else? All righty. Well, I hope that everyone um, enjoyed that video. And now I'm going to turn it over to Lynn. Thanks, Shannon. And thank you for sharing uh, participants on the phone. I enjoyed your takeaways. And I think that the video was the perfect pre-work for getting you to think about executive presence. I'm sorry that I could not be with you at your first meeting. and It's obvious I had to videotape myself, but as Shannon said, videotaping is a good exercise, but you still never like watching yourself on video, but it's time, it does give you self-development. So today what we're really going to focus on is we're going to take that career management will, and if you think about the seven E's that are components of the will, we're going to focus on executive presence. And so as I'm starting to open up this session on executive presence, in the chat function, I'd like you to share um, someone you know. It could be a Hollywood star, maybe it's someone on television, it could be a local leader, or someone, a favorite book character. Who exemplifies the executive presence for you? So if you type that in the chat function, i like to see. To the left of your screen, you have a chat function. So just I'm asking everyone to type one person who in their mind has a high level of gravitas and executive presence. Laura, thanks for George Clooney and President Obama. Yes, I think a lot of people would also say Michelle Obama. 
Yes, Suzanne Michelle Obama. Michelle Obama. Maurice, I don't know Dumbledore. Laura Bush, Dan Pilata. Kim, oh, Houston Philpot surely does, yes. So these are great examples. When you hear me today speak about executive presence, I'm talking about the ability to project gravitas. It's confidence. It really is poised under pressure. It's decisive. It entails your communication skills, and that's why I think today's video was so important. Your speaking skills, your ability to read an audience and communicate to that audience and listen, and the appearance, how you look. Um, Laura, thank you for yours for Elizabeth Warren also. So when we think about executive presence, um, it's a great asset to have, but often when you don't have it, it really can become a career staller. And if you look at this survey right here, it says executive presence at my company is defined and conformed to traditional white male standards. And so you see a lot of people who are African American feel that way, even Asian and Hispanic. Um, feeling the need to compromise my authentic behavior to conform to executive presence is also a common thing. And then uh, many people uh, are unclear about how do I build the skill set, how do I improve my executive presence. Interestingly, if you look at that, about 84% of Asians and 80% of Hispanics. And so we do know that individuals that do not have executive presence, often it becomes a career staller. So the traditional perceptions of executive presence are really this notion of, okay, people think you're leadership material, if you're assertive, if you know how to smooth and show teeth, um, if you can command a room. Sometimes it's associated with appearances, so being tall or having gray hair and being male. And often if you think about it, right, 96% of Fortune 500 CEOs are male. Only 4.4% are, are, are color. And so our image for executive presence sometimes does become that senior leadership, seasoned, tall, white male. Um, thus it is assumed that when we start to think about our executive presence, that's the attributes that we have. And if you only take away one thing from this webinar today is I want you to think outside the box. I want you to create your own narrative for what executive presence is and make your own strip. I want it to come from your values, your principles, and to be authentic. So if you think about it, we have a mosaic here. We have everything from the CEO of PepsiCo to um, the former CEO of American Express. We have a university president. We have the CEO of the Detroit Science Center. So executive presence comes in many forms. And that's why I started with this exercise here, getting you to think about those forms and those people. Because one way you can develop your own executive presence is by looking at role models and thinking about the attributes you would appreciate in them, ones you want to adopt, ones you want to adapt, and how you can learn from them. So let's um, unpack. I gave you the big definition of executive president. I'm going to revisit it. But I also want you to think about each component, and that's what we're going to spend some time for with for the next few minutes. So if you think about it as an or, and it's an or, and people are able to command the room because they're confident, they're also competent in what they do. And we know from the video and many of our conversations that being confident comes from being prepared and investing in your education, your professional development, and your life experiences. The third big component of executive presence is interpersonal skills. And then finally, this um, thing that kind of is really the overlay for executive presence is the ability to convince others. And you're convincing others because of two reasons. You're credible, you can get the job done, you know what you're talking about, and you're authentic. You're not faking it. You're embracing your, who you are, and you're bringing your best self to a situation as you demonstrate your executive presence. So when we think about the dimensions of executive presence, let's start to think about character, substance, and style. 
So character, it's the most foundational value. It's who you are. Sometimes we have a hard time describing our character. It could be even as a self, if I would ask many of you. Um, in fact, I'm going to ask you in a second, what's the most important attribute about your character? And how do you use that as a source of power for executive presence? So for me, I think uh, my character, a lot of my character centers around learning and the acquisition of knowledge and sharing it. So that's a big character attribute for me. But when you start to think about character, it's those values. It's your North Star. Star. It's things such as integrity, courage, optimism, the ability to be focused, to have discretion, to have honesty. And character is so important for executive presence um, because it helps you to clarify your personal values. But even more importantly, as I said, it empowers you to behave consistently when you lead. If you know the source of your power for character, you will consistently use it. It will be the inner strength, even if you're an introvert or don't like to command the room or make public presentations. So the core, some of the core dimensions of character are, is a person authentic? Are they true to themselves? Are they able to show concern when they're in a room? Integrity, am I telling someone the truth? Do I live by my values? Do I demonstrate ethical behavior? Restraint is a very big one. You can think of restraint as manifesting with emotional intelligence. It can be discipline. It can be focus. But you don't want to be known as the person who really does, um, is not emotionally stable, not calm, can't handle negative or positive feedback. And then the final dimension of character is humility. And humility comes in many forms. Um, one is it's taking the me and transcending to the we. It comes in showing gratitude. And so there are lots of ways to think about humility. It's appreciation for others' awareness. It's the ability to think about maybe the group that's marginalized or not popular. And many of these character substances, we, we forget sometimes. We forget that a lot of people that we think highly of it's because of their character. I, I think most of us would agree that when we think about Elizabeth Warren and Michelle Obama, they're very authentic. They have a concern for others. They lead with integrity. Oftentimes, um, when they hear something, they have to lead with restraint and having the ability to be humble. So um, before I move on to this notion of substance, I want to go back to character again, and I'd like everyone in the chat function to think about their character and the one attribute of their character that really is the source of power for their executive presence. And it comes in all different forms. It can even be things such as wit and humor. Um, it, but just think about, and I'll type it in now, as I, as I said, mine was knowledge and acquiring knowledge and then using knowledge to make others be better. It's a very good of my character. Lucille, thanks for openness. Maurice is a positive person. Nicole really values being a team player. Lauren is similar to me with a learning mindset. Um, Caitlin is service, being of service, helping and building communities. And Caitlin, I would say communities is almost tied with me after learning, so I can appreciate that. Avery, when she thinks about her source of power, I like this, critical thinking and using that critical thinking skill to connect the dots. So, and uh, interesting, our chairperson said moving forward, which is a unique skill set about, you know, let's not look at the past, let's on a positive note move forward. And Laura, is, Laura, you're getting very deep on us. Um, discernment, creating space to understand where people are coming from, and then how to use where they're coming from to make decisions as part of discernment. So thank you all for sharing that. So the second aspect is substance. Um, it's being solid. It's the foundation. And as you know, I use this chemistry icon here. It's wisdom, it's confidence, it's composure, it's strategic leadership. Um, I, I have several colleagues that hate to see people who have style but no substance, and that's why I'm starting with substance first. And imagine that maybe I shouldn't be using the chemical representation for substance, but maybe next time 
I also use a figure of an empty suit. And I think we all know people sometimes who they can have on the most beautiful armor, external suit, but they don't have substance. So substance is important. If you ask, especially at the level of leadership you are, substance is going to what takes you to get to that next promotion. So how do you use substance to differentiate yourself? And we talk a lot about this, having that learning mindset, making those investments in substance so substance becomes part of your executive presence. So first, think about how you can use your work or life experiences a part of your substance. Um, often, if you ask anybody I know, I tend to tell lots of stories about being a parent because I probably learned the most about leadership from being a parent to my two children. So bringing your life experiences in. Building local or industry expert. Do you want to be the expert known in the philanthropic sector for social justice grant making or grant making in the environment? or the industry expert for someone who has extensive knowledge on a community foundation or a family foundation. Having a unique knowledge or skills, uh, many people don't know my undergraduate degree is accounting and I'm a CPA, and so on the nonprofit boards I often serve on, I get stuck on the finance or the audit committee because I have this unique skill of accounting. What is your unique skill, and how are you using that unique skill as part of your executive presence? Thinking about credentials, when you complete this program here, you will have a credential that you can put on your LinkedIn profile or your resume. At each phase of your career, think about what credentials you want to have, everything from being something such as a certified project manager to it could be some workshop or training. And then um, one we often forget about is sometimes we can be a curator of information or news. And so do you have a blog? Do you use your LinkedIn profile to curate news or information? Are you the go-to person who um, sends out emails such as I do at 2 a.m. in the morning because you found some I find some information I think Shannon might like? And so all of these differentiate you on substance. And it's thinking about which ones are important for you, which one will speak to your substance, and how will they advance your career and personal goals. The other way I want you to think about the pathway to differentiation is um, thinking about the various things you do and the level of competency. Where are you? Some things will be a novice because you think about learning as generative. We might be starting something new. Other competencies, we may be an expert or proficient. And I have five arrows here for you to think about it in various ways. And so when you're a novice, you really are learning the rules of a discipline or a profession. So if you're new to philanthropy, you may be learning the rules of grant making or the rules of board governance. As you start to become an expert, it was um, intuition. So you heard me at the in, um, jokingly with Shannon say, well, sweet potato pies are easy to make. That's because I've made them since I was in elementary school, and so I have a little level of intuition where I don't need the recipe anymore. I understand how to do it and look at it and tell if it's going to be a good sweet potato pie value. So think about those things. Where are you a novice? Where are you an expert? Um, what do you have intuition on? The blue arrow, the royal blue, um, being from Michigan, I think all blue is Michigan blue, but the royal blue talks about considering everything. So when you're a novice, you have to make a decision, and you have to have all the facts on the table. But when you start to become an expert, you see patterns. You don't, know, you don't need to see all the data because you're so good at seeing the patterns you can make a decision. Thirdly, when you're a novice, you, you, you really are a detached observer. You're not embedded. Um, you, you're not thinking integratively. Instead, you're... Um, you just have to think, okay, I observe, and then I make those decisions. But once you become part of the system, you're more substance. Uh, if you've been in the organization a longer time, there are two paths you can go on. People love you and they value your executive presence, or they know you so well and they don't like you. And so you want to make sure you're known as someone who has executive presence because you've actually transformed from a detached observer or a newcomer to a person who understands how the system works. The gray one is um, similar to rules and intuition. It's going from explicit knowledge to tacit knowledge. 
there are lots of things we do. Um, many of us have spent a lot of time in Michigan, and if you spend a lot of time in Michigan, you usually are a pretty fast and speedy driver. You don't have to think about every time when you get in the car, you make a left turn, you brake, you make a right turn. Driving has become tacit for you. And then the final one is formal learning. When you're learning something new, going back to the driver ed's metaphor, when you're learning something new, you take classes, you have to practice how you're driving, your parents are chaperoning you. And then, um, you know, as you start to move up the driving and you want to improve your skills, much of the learning comes by doing, and it's a very informal process. So I'm not going to ask you to type this in the chat function, but this is something as you're starting to look through your assessment data, as you're starting to think about your career brand and your executive presence, what are the substance dimensions really that you plan to use for differentiation? Also going back again to what is your pathway? What do you want to be known for? What type of tacit knowledge are you good at? How are you systems thinking? These are very important things to think about. The next component I want to talk about is style, and style comes in many forms. Um, similar to some of you talked about your values, so for example, Shannon talked about Justin being a part of her values and how that empowers her, or Laura talked about discernment. I want you to think about um, what is your one um, shield of armor that you like to use for style? So, um, you know, I love clothes, so I really like clothes, and in particular, I like jackets and scarves, so that's kind of my thing. And so when I have to get on stage and have presence, even though I'm not seeing you today, I have on a bright purple jacket and I have a scarf because that's my stage costume. That helps me get into the mode of executive presence. So um, as in the chat function, start to think about it. I have, um, I have one friend who's a college president, and she loves fancy necklaces, and that's iconic for her style. It's very cool right now, we know, for men to um, use bow ties and socks. And so start to think about what are some things in your style. Um, Shannon likes heels. Yeah, heels are not my thing. My, I've never had good feet, but, yes, yeah, Shannon likes heels. So when I speak of style, um, it, it, it comes in many forms, it's, but it's the first impression people get. It's your image. It's your mannerism. It entails your interpersonal behavior. And, you know, I love this um, quote right here. Whether we like it or not, people judge you on style. And so it must be congruent with what you're trying to convey and what you want people to see you as a leader. Some leaders will perceive problems with style, or they would say um, maybe it prevents people from appreciating their substance, and so they'll tune it out or write it off, but people do consider style. Um, we've had some other good examples here. Caitlin talked about bright, bold lipstick. Uh, we have another one with black tights and black pumps, but it's knowing your style. So some of the attributes, and so it may not be, we all use the appearance ones, but you might have other ones. Um, so there's definitely appearance, and that's the top that comes to the mind, but there's intentionality. There's inclusiveness, and maybe having a strategy for inclusiveness. And so one of the ways I do inclusiveness, and I can usually understand people, is I usually start to question, so where did you grow up? Because your formative years tell me so much about who you are and a sense of, uh, gives me a sense of how I can be aware of who you are. So thinking about inclusiveness, it's how you interact with people. It's your ability to listen and stimulate dialogue. And then it's, um, it's how you do assertiveness. It doesn't have to be rude. It can be done with grace. And so it's important about how you do assertiveness, especially I see the best executive presence is when you balance assertiveness with this inclusiveness and really care about people. So some attributes about are being polished and groomed. Um, sometimes, um, sometimes, you know, the stylish clothes, people will say there's often kind of a, a saying, you don't dress for your current job, you dress for the next job you want. And so those are kind of the, the style when we think about the clothes, but then there's also the complementary actions. As you're thinking about your style, think about what showcases your strengths. Are you looking appropriate for your audience? So um, 
you know, I said I kind of dressed up and rolled. There's some days that I really do feel like wearing my jeans with the Tara poles, but most people would say that's not appropriate in the dean's office. And so making sure you're looking appropriate for your audience. I, it would not be nice if I had my tear up jeans and the president of the university came by. Be beware of casual and cool culture, so know your culture norms. If I worked in the art industry or theater, I would have a different style. And uh, this is another metaphor. Stay in costume to stay in character. Sometimes the costumes that we wear help us to stay in character. I love what Takia said is, is that hers really was um, kind of beyond her clothes when she thought about the warmth, bright smile, and acknowledging people. So that's the skills and the attributes she uses to work her room. And when people think of her appearance, they probably think of her warmth and smile. Some of the style blunders, are, if you notice the blunders that I have here on this slide, uh, aren't the ones related to clothes per se. They're the ones related to persona. People who don't have integrity, it doesn't matter what they say or how they look. I'm going to discount them, and most of us value integrity. Social awkwardness is something that you can work through. Flip-flopping, people, who, especially when you're in a board meeting or in the room, oh, I agree with John, and then the next thing, oh, I agree with Mary. So flip-flopping. We all hate bullies, so we know that that's a bad attribute to have. Being shallow or lightweight, that's why preparation is so important. Invest in the skill sets. Have the substance and don't have people perceive you as shallow or lightweight. And then any inappropriate behavior, and I think as adults we know what inappropriate behavior is. Uh, the person who's screaming in the workplace is an example of inappropriate behavior. Communication is very important, and it comes in many forms. And so when you think of communication, think of your writing skills, but also think of your speaking skills. The ability to command a room, that's establishing a connection. Um, I have one colleague who will always get to a meeting early so she can make a connection with people, get to know who's in the room, the power of the politics, and a personal um, hello to them. Using a sense of humor. And for many millennials, the ability to banner is a skill set you don't have because, um, and you have to think about how you're going to invest in that. And it's because that you spend a lot, you spend a lot of time in technology, and so you're very good at technology. And when you think of older Gen Xers such as myself and baby boomers, we may lag in technology, but we had to learn how to banter because advanced technology for us was the telephone. So learn how the art of making small chat, and then body language and posture. Um, complementing these actions are the tone of your voice, as we have emphasized, over prepare. Um, don't let anybody um, challenge your authority. So if someone challenges your authority, have an answer or say, I'll get back to you, even if you have to follow up with an email. And as I said, broaden your small talk. Oratorical skills are so important in this world. And so practice. Look at some of the best. Um, my husband likes to look at Dr. King's speeches, Mandela's one. Many of my colleagues love to look at TED Talks, and so I do recommend TED Talks to understand style, to understand how they use technology, to really look at principles of design. But commit to at least once a month listening to a TED Talk. I also value the ability to tell stories, and so I love to listen to things such as NPR or the Moth Radio Show. And the value of NPR over YouTube, television, or TED Talk is when you have to listen, you're focusing on the sense of the story and you're not focusing on the visual. And so NPR is a good source to listen to stories sometimes. With regards to written communication, realize that your executive presence does extend beyond oral communication. Think about what your email style is. Mine tends to be short, organized, bullet points, and very succinct. And so that's part of my executive presence because my belief is if I need to write a long email, I need to have a conversation with you. Think about your written communication on social media. So often I'll see spelling errors on social media, and I know it's acceptable. But once again, you're building an executive presence. And then this other icon I have is really emphasizing Part of executive presence is the ability to communicate data because the data tells the story. 
So in your current roles, what kind of data story are you telling? What data do you need to be able to talk about? Is it everything from how many dollars spent to expenses data to market share data, but know the data that drives your organization and your profession? Communication blunders include, include lack of eye contact, being nervous, and then we're all nervous sometimes in public speaking. That's why we prepare. Having too many props. We all hate the PowerPoint that has 10 or 15 things on a slide and the deck has 100. Uh, rambling, controlling your arm, and how do you prevent rambling and the controlling of arm? You practice. The same thing with having a high-pitched voice. You practice, you work on your voice tone. So I want to wrap up before I turn it back over to Shannon with getting you, um, as you're working with your coaches, after you're working with your mentors, to start to think about some goals and how you want to enact your executive presence. So Ebony will be sending out this PowerPoint tech today, and there's a great worksheet that you can use. If you notice, it has three columns. One has attributes of executive presence, so um, living your values, demonstrating your strengths, what kind of networks do you use to build your executive presence? I would like you to currently think about some of the best practices you're using, and then some areas for improvement, such as, um, you know, do I need to make my emails longer? Is that something I need to work on? So those are examples there. Another tool that I'm giving you is um, for you to think about managing your audiences. This could be a good thing or a bad thing, but every day when you get up and you go to work, you're on stage, and you have to invest in your executive presence. And so what I want you to think about is depending on the day, depending on the week, who is your audience? Some days you might be meeting with your boss that's managing up, and what type of executive presence do you want to convey to your boss? Other times it could be customers, grantees, partners. It might be your team, but think about the audience. Think about how you're going to be on stage, the costume you're wearing. Think about the warmth and the personality and how you're going to demonstrate your substance. And some takeaways are, so I want you essentially to think about what is your executive presence script. And when you think about a script, it's, it's the same thing you would have a play. It's what's your narrative. So who are you? What are your values? How do you showcase your strengths, and what do you want to accomplish? So at this point, I want to turn it over to Shannon, who's going to talk about the um, executive presence and your leadership assessment. Thank you, Lynn. Appreciate it. That was a lot of really great information. Um, before we move forward, I just want to pause and see if anyone has any questions before we move forward for Lynn. And for those of you, um, that are on the audio, please feel free to just type that into the chat if you have any questions. What I'd like to do is take a moment and think about executive presence in light of your 360 self-assessment. Uh, by now, everyone has completed that self-assessment. And I was wondering if we can just kind of reflect on just that process of what does it mean to do a 360 self-assessment, to go in and begin to answer these questions about how you see yourself and how others perceive you? Um, can we just kind of go around the group, and if you all can just maybe just say a word that describes how you felt about doing the self-assessment? And we started at the bottom of the participant list before, so at the top of the participant list. So we can start at the bottom with Takia. Uh, hello. Um, I think um, I think I, I was surprised. I was surprised that it was um, so hard for me to do, and because I was thinking about how others perceive me and not how I perceive myself. So I had to just kind of shut that off and just answer intuitively. Sure. Thank you. It can be very challenging to have to go in and analyze yourself. Uh, Nicole. How was that experience of doing the self-assessment? Actually, um, some of the questions I felt a little uneasy 
about answering about myself. Okay. They're, they're questions that I I wasn't necessarily expecting to have to reflect on myself. Mm-hmm. So a little bit uneasy. A little bit uneasy. Yes, yes. It, it can it it can doing a self assessment can take you down some paths that you hadn't necessarily explored or been prepared to explore in the form of a self assessment. Certainly, Ben. Benjamin. All right, let's move on to Maurice. Yeah, so um, for me, this uh, I kind of took uh, kind of a two-step approach to, to filling it out. I, I did more of a, a self-reflection before even going into the uh, actual questionnaire um, and kind of took a stock on some of the things that I can improve on. Um, just in general, you know, not knowing what the questions were because I wanted, um, in anticipation of the questions, I kind of um, – wanted to, to do that before having questions lead uh, my thoughts. And then I just answered the questions very intuitively. So I didn't really um, spend too much time in the actual system, but the reflection beforehand guided my um, responses throughout. What a great approach to kind of make sure that you weren't being led by the questions, that you were really open and allowing yourself the opportunity to just go in a very natural flow as opposed to intentionally picking a certain path. That was a great way to do that. Thank you. Lauren. Um, I I would say surprised, too. I was um, surprised at kind of my initial reaction to some of the questions and, and how I think I do, but also, um, you know, how I want to do and kind of managing, managing that and making sure I was, you know, going with my initial gut reaction. Certainly. Laura Adi. Um, hi. I, uh, I found the assessment to be um, a bit of a challenge, uh, similar to the first comment that was made. As I'm fresh uh, off experiences where white males saying the same thing um, in similar ways uh, as myself are praised by other white males, and there's a perception that their leadership um, is is stronger, and I can appreciate the dynamics. I think for me, it's you know kind of sifting through what's your own perception of leadership, what are others' perceptions of leadership, what's going on there, and and what do you do about that in a way that also um, maintains your authenticity and the things that you're proud of. I think that's um, kind of a real a real space that I'm in right now for some personal growth. Sure. I think one of the greatest takeaways that I get every time I listen to Lynn do this webinar and do this presentation on executive presence is the fact that executive presence isn't something that is defined by gender or ethnicity. It's a series of characteristics about who people are um, outside of those labels we may place. And so everyone can have executive presence. We don't necessarily have to limit ourselves to weigh to the way that executive presence has been traditionally defined. Mm-hmm. And so I always like the example of having people say, okay, so now who do you think exhibits this? And then allowing your mind to identify people that may share some of those characteristics but may not, as that there are people out there, um, regardless of gender or ethnicity, that demonstrate executive presence in a very powerful way. Uh, the uh, head of PepsiCo, uh, whose picture she had, uh, Indra Nui, and um, if I'm pronouncing her name wrong, uh, please correct that, Lynn. But wonderful example of someone who has strong executive presence. So thank you for sharing that and being so transparent. Uh, Kayla. Hi, everyone, and I apologize. I didn't do a full introduction in the beginning. So this is Kayla Roney-Smith from the Hazel Park Promise Zone. And for me, doing this self-assessment, I also reflected beforehand, and I had uh, kind of one major weakness that I feel like I need to work on. And doing the assessment really made me realize how many things can be impacted by that. So for me, it's uh, just making sure I don't overschedule myself and um, making sure I kind of schedule time to get things done between meetings and um, kind of along those lines. So it really just reinforced how much I need to work on that because of the other things that that can affect. 
Excellent, excellent. So you begin to see those patterns and recognize them. Um, that's outstanding. Avery? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so the thing that I wanted to do, and I'm sure that I'm not the only one, but I really wanted to overthink all of my answers and try to kind of come up with an example of where I was with that and instead of being more general. So, um, so I actually took a look at it, and then I ended up stepping away from it and coming back to it. Um, so that kind of was how I processed all of it. I didn't really overthink it while I was stepping away from it, but it just helped me to have the chance to to take a look at it and kind of go, okay, this is sort of where we're at, and then come back to it. And so um, then one of the things I did um, reflect on was um, – what I admired in leaders and, um, you know, the things that I, the qualities that I would really like to have that I don't feel like I have right now, those are sort of those um, narrative responses. So that was how I tackled that piece of it. Excellent. Thank you, Avery. Uh, I just got a note. Kaylee, you're on the line now? Hi. Yes, I called in. I wasn't getting um, any microphone from my computer. Okay. Um, but I can like be heard okay share? now? Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, sure. Um, so one of my biggest takeaways from filling out uh, the assessment was that I kind of realized as I was going through the questions that a lot of my weaknesses stem from um, places where I feel like I have fear. And so some of that can be from a fear of not being understood or heard or a fear of not being um, – very efficient, um, and so kind of my weaknesses are in sometimes overcompensating or trying to trying to come up um, with a way to to play against that. And so I think that that'll be a, something for me to work on going forward. And it was good to have the assessment highlight that for me. Excellent. And you know that is the beauty of the assessment, where you begin to kind of identify that area that you can begin to adjust or make some minor changes in that will have really strong impact going forward. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Laura Sharphorn, are you still on the line? Yes. Can you hear me? Excellent. Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Um, I think like a couple other people mentioned, I also felt uncomfortable. Um, I think just balancing between um, how I perceive myself and how thinking about how other people might perceive me um, and trying to, you know, figure out my rating that way and, and what to put more um, more emphasis on. Um, and then I think, too, and this might be a female thing, but I think we rate ourselves lower on things. Um, and so I think part of it was just challenging of thinking about, well, wow, I, I really am good at this, or I'm good at this, too. Um, so I think being honest in that and recognizing my strengths. Um, but then I think there were also things that I feel like I'm pretty good at, but I want to get better um, so I think I didn't know how to rate it because I was kind of thinking like, well, if I rate a little lower, maybe my coach will work with me on that. So should I rate it lower? Um, so, yeah, I think it was just kind of weighing the options and balancing how to rate each item. Certainly. Uh, and, you know, I want to just kind of take a moment and touch on something that you just said about how uh, women may tend to be a little bit harder on themselves. Uh, Certainly, all most of the data when doing these kind of valuations, it says that they that women do tend to be a little bit harder on themselves, and that they don't always give themselves credit for the things they're doing well, and tend to be a little bit harsh on the things that they may be strong at, but they feel they may not be as strong as whoever they are comparing themselves to. Um, so it's great that you acknowledge that, um, and that you gave yourself permission to be to be honest, to notice those strengths that you have, and um, continue to put those forward. Excellent. Let me ask this question. In light of what you saw in doing that self-assessment, realizing it was a little uncomfortable, you may have even experienced that somewhat as you were thinking about your own executive presence, as you begin to think about your energy, as you begin to think about how you communicate, the substance that you bring uh, with you uh, into conversations, as well as your own personal style. And so I'm curious if you all feel comfortable if you could just share based in based on what you heard today 
in light of what you may have observed just in answering the questions of 360, what are some things that you feel that you may want to begin to tweak as it relates to your executive presence? I know that for me, when I first began to look at this, it was energy. Um, it was definitely, definitely the energy that I brought into a room. Um, I knew, I noticed that I could be very high energy and very low energy, depending on what was happening, and having consistent uh, energy that I'm bringing to conversations was really critical for me. Is there anyone that would like to share one of the things that they think that as they reflect upon their 360 and reflect upon uh, today's presentation that they think, boy, I, I've now recognized an area that I'd like to begin to tweak? Well, one of the things that I know, and Lucille, are you still on the line? Uh, yes. Can you hear me now, Shannon? Yeah, I can. Lucille will be talking with everyone about taking a deep breath and taking a step back when you begin to go over the 360 assessment. Um, Lucille, could you speak a little bit about um, how, everyone, how we're going to be encouraging everyone to take that deep breath and when they get the results back when they're talking with their coaches? Yes, be happy to. Um, thank you. Yes, I've, I've given a lot of 360s and had time to spend with um, different people at different levels of an organization as they, re re as they review their results of a 360, and there tends to be some consistent patterns. And there's, there's excitement, there's fear, there's, there's the, what does this say about me, um, how are other people seeing me that um, I don't know, or... What is it that people are seeing, that, seeing about me that I didn't want them to know? And so being able to step back and look at it in terms of a snapshot in time. And this is available information for you to take a look at and work with your coach on where I, what does this tell me about myself and where is it that I want to go? What is it that I want to work towards? And how does this reflect and help inform me on setting that path? So really looking at it from a, a pragmatic point, identifying what are the areas that come up that feel like, oh, that, that hurts to see that, or oh, I was afraid that might show up, or that's a whole lot higher than I thought it was going to be. You're going to get a whole mix of things in there um, that are going to be, be reflected back at you, that you yourself being able to put that out there and where you are and how you're reacting to it is really important throughout the whole process. It's part of the learning so um, I love to step back. I always talk about it in terms of being a snapshot in time. It's not the total picture of who you are. It is just a, a tool that we use to begin the conversation and to, to help inform you to pick out some goals to move forward. And so you can take it in as deep as you want, and you can also take it as shallow as you want, but look at it as a tool. Thank you so much, Lucille. And so I wanted Lucille to just kind of share that because I heard each of you uh, talk a little bit about just some of the uneasiness and uncomfortableness. And what we want to really emphasize that it really is just a snapshot. This is not a permanent assessment or something that cannot be adjusted, but it is just a snapshot in time. And the coaches as well as uh, Lynn and I's facilitators are available to help you think through that, help you process that, and then you have your mentor uh, who will help you work with the information as well. Um, Shannon, I have a, a question. So it was Certainly. hard for me to um, respond very quickly to your answer because I, I felt like there was one element in everything that was talked about that I definitely would, you know, <laughs> need to work on as far as um, just understanding executive presence altogether and then um, – and so I, I guess that my challenge is kind of understanding how this process flows because there are there are areas that I know I need to work on as far as understanding um, uh, my expertise and, and working on you know specifically how do I gain knowledge in a particular area to work on that that part of my 
development and then also my my presence and so um it's, I just feel like there are just many different elements to kind of work on, and I kind of feel like there are – I don't know how it's all going to mesh together. And I don't know if that's just me. I'm kinda... No, no. Actually, I, I, I would doubt that you're the only person um, that may be feeling that way in terms of thinking about how the assessment – and these different pieces, executive presence, and the other ones that we'll talk about will all come together. Um, Lynn, I don't know if you want to uh, take a stab at addressing that. I I think that um, it is overwhelming, and it's you got to think about the whole person and what you want to focus on. Mm-hmm. And your focus it, does. You were going to say something, Shannon? Yeah, it was. And that is that, you know, when you're thinking about this, because we do have a short period of time, although it doesn't seem like it, May will be here before we know it. And so your coaches are going to work with you after you, get those assess- after you receive your assessment results and identifying one or two things that you'd like to begin to work on and develop. Because it is kind of like drinking from a fire hose. When you're getting this information, there's so much. But you're going to identify one or two key areas where you feel as though, boy, these are the two things that if I begin to make some adjustments, I could get the most leverage in moving to the next place that I'd like to be professionally and personally. And so no one will be pressuring you to make all of those changes. Uh, I know I embarked um, almost a year ago on a weight loss journey, and it was in getting healthier. And what was most overwhelming for me was the fact that I was trying to do everything at once. I was going to exercise. I was going to eat right. I was going to do all these things. And I had to take a step back and say, what's the one thing I can do right now? And just put that into play for a few months. And then as I began to do that, then I picked up another piece of that getting healthy puzzle. It will be the same thing for this professional development um, journey for you. You'll look at maybe it's executive presence. It could be there may be some issues around, uh, specifically around substance, becoming that expert in one or two areas. It could be your communication style. Perhaps uh, for some people they're a little bit more timid in meetings, and so they need to be a little bit more assertive. And so you'll work with your coach and as well as with your mentor about identifying those very simple steps that you can take, and we'll be along the we'll be helping you along that journey. Um, to identify that, to tweak that. But no one will be asking you to um, conquer all of the results that you get back in one felt swoop. Right. And so, Shannon, you and I always think alike. It's it's how you're going to focus and prioritize and what you want to accomplish in your professional and personal life. It may also be integrating the feedback from your mentor, your coach, and your also your 360. And starting small, and, and things that you can achieve those small wins. Mm-hmm. But thank you for thank you for that statement. Um, is anyone else feeling the way? If so, if you can maybe chat a yes, I'm feeling a little overwhelmed at that point because we want to hear from you and know when we need to take a pause and take a breath because we know that we're giving you lots of information. When we think about the next steps, I always believe in application uh, for anything that we're doing. So I'd like for you to kind of think about um, how you're going to apply the information that you heard today uh, to your next meeting with your mentor and your coach. And so obviously there are probably some things that you're brewing in your mind right now about executive presence. And then when you meet with your mentor, you may want to talk with them about if they if they joined you on the call, debrief with them about this webinar. If they weren't able to join, um, maybe share some of your takeaways from the webinar with them. And that's a great conversation. And for those of you that may not have um, had a recent connection um, with your mentor, maybe send them an email about the takeaways that you had after watching the video as well as um, participating in today's webinar. Something else I'd like you to consider. We did an overview of the Capstone Project during our in-person meeting, 
and we outlined some of the different projects that people have created um, for their capstone. What I'd like for you to think about as you're beginning to develop the idea of what you'd like your capstone project to be is think about how that capstone project can be a way for you to demonstrate executive presence within your organization and within the, your field. For the group that made the video about philanthropy, it was a way to demonstrate the substance, that they really understood the various ways that philanthropy impacts the community, how to get millennials and those that are even younger involved in philanthropy. It was a great way to demonstrate that substance. Uh, for those that have done giving circles, they use their capstone project as a way to demonstrate their substance as well as an opportunity to demonstrate how they communicate, communicating with their peers and bringing them together and demonstrating that leadership style as well. So I'd like for you to, as you're reflecting upon your capstone, to also think about how you can begin to employ the capstone as a way to demonstrate your executive presence. And so now we have some debarding quotes, and I'm going to turn it back over to Lynn for quotes from Amy Cuddy. And just so, uh, how many people have, are you all familiar with Amy Cuddy? Yes. Excellent, excellent, great. So we have some debarding quotes. Lynn, if you'd like to uh, read those really great quotes from Amy Cuddy. And she has uh, good TED Talks if you want to listen to more about her subjects. The first one, presence is removing your mask create a deep and true connection with people. And many of you talked about that in the chat today. Presence is confidence without arrogance. We convince by our presence, which is from Walt Whitney. And presence is being myself and keeping confident no matter what happens. So thank you for sharing your time. And at this point, we're going to turn it over to Ebony. Thank you all so much. Um, I appreciate everyone's transparency and honesty. Um, I want to thank you all for joining us today for this webinar and an extended thanks to Lynn and Shannon. Um, as you can see on the screen now, we have three upcoming programs we want to share with you today. Um, as you see, they may be valuable. On December 12th, we have our webinar, Building a Career brand in the philanthropic sector. January 20th is our midpoint meeting event, and then we have another event coming up in February. Of course, you'll be receiving email correspondence from me and Shannon regarding um, filling in some information and completing some materials up until that point. Later this week, I will be sending out um, a survey link for the evaluation. And with that survey link, there will also, also be a link to join the online community for both the mentees and mentors. And with that as well, for the participants who are not on this call, I will be sending, and also the ones who are on this call, um, so should I just say all participants of the cohort, I'll be sending a link with the webinar so you guys can always tap into it if you ever need to or maybe you may have forgot for excuse me, maybe you forgot some of the content that was discussed while, while you're talking with your mentor and your coaches and you want to remember a slide, so you'll kind of always have it to go back to. Um, thank you again, and I wish you all have a great day. Thank you, everybody, for participating. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, everyone.